Hi, and welcome to another episode of Startup Stories, where I interview the best and brightest startup founders and experts so you can be ahead of the curve with your own startup venture. This episode brings us together with Ike Festini from LucaBox, a startup that enables retailers to send their products to end customers via flexible delivery options. The LucaBox team pays great attention to being green and will save over 12 tons of CO2 within the next five years, delivering goods by bike whenever possible. Ike and I met at a startup workshop years ago, when the LucaBox idea was still in its infancy. When I recently asked her if there was any crazy things she believed that many others didn't, her answer was truly inspiring and motivating. I'm deeply convinced that life is a playground to be enjoyed to the last bit, she said. Life is not supposed to be hard. Work is supposed to motivate and inspire you to your core. Find your mojo, everything else, love, joy and success will follow. I loved having Ike on the show and asking her all of my burning questions about how she turned her initial idea into what it is today. How she acquired her first customers, her daunting and sometimes hurtful experience with investors and so much more. I'm super excited to share this episode with you today. Enjoy! So, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks, Thanks for having me, Daniel. Of course, of course. We met a long time ago in a, in a startup workshop, I remember. Uh, you, were, you were pitching Luca Books. Um, but for the people who, who don't know what you do and who you are, could you briefly tell us your name and yeah, what does your startup do? Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Eike Festini. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Luca Box. And um, to explain Luca Box uh, with an elevator pitch, for, for um, any enterprise who needs fast and flexible deliveries, the Luca Box platform is a unique logistics orchestration solution that offers state of the art and sustainable last mile services. Unlike traditional logistics providers, though, we enable access with easy implementation. All right. So if I'm a if I'm an an online shop, yeah, I go to you. I get your plug and play solution, and you help me deliver my products to the end customers. I, I think it's within an hour or two hours. Exactly within one hour or two hour or any flexible time or day. Yeah, that is super fast. <laughs> I'm quite impressed how you managed to do that. Um, but I, as I remember when we were when we met. I don't know if it was two years ago or three years ago. Yeah. I was working on another startup myself that failed. Yeah. And you're still still with that. But if I remember correctly, the initial idea was a bit different. Exactly. And I was wondering how you started out with that idea and how you how you tested, you know, if people had that problem that you were trying to solve. Mm-hmm. Um, the original idea was uh, the, what we call um, the first mile in logistics, meaning getting products from an end customer to another place. So my co-founder at the time moved to Switzerland and uh, sold everything on eBay. Well, not everything, but the majority of her furniture. And she made quite a bunch of money. So there was a, a, quite a thrill involved. But then um, she realized that now she had to pack everything, package it somehow, you know, and get it to the post office. Uh, of course, for some people, you can still uh, get, you know, find an appointment and maybe just uh, sell, sell the item at the spot. But the majority of the things needed to be shipped. Um, that that very very brief very quickly turned into like a frustration point. So she had it, it was her idea. She had the idea of creating an app uh, where you could just take a picture of the item you wanna you wanna ship. A courier would then come, pick the item up as it is, take it to a warehouse, package it professionally, and ship it into the world. I I still to this day love the idea. I really do. And I also still feel the pain every time I sell something. on. <laughs> but um, we did a pilot uh, very, very quickly afterwards and a very, very simple pilot with um, the minimum, really the minimum requirements. I think uh, we even put it on, on Facebook where we invited, uh, you know, the people we knew to participate in the pilot and everybody wants to ship something to some somebody. Right. So um, people sent um, like the, like yeah, stones to their to their best friend, you know, as a joke or something. But they all used the app. They all took the picture, and they all gave us um, a pickup time and a 
uh, and a place. Um, it needed to be in Zurich city only. Uh, and yeah, I think it was more than 50 participants. Uh, it was the whole uh, Luca Box team at the time. I mean, we were four people and some friends uh, who actually rode the bikes, uh, you know, to those people and, 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 and brought it back to, it was at the Impact Hub where we got an office for a day. Uh, they helped us with the pilot. We then packaged it and we very, it took us the whole day, the whole thing took us the whole day. <laughs> Uh, uh, but the, the most absurd, the, the, the really the absurdest point of that pilot was when we then took all the parcels to the post office and stood in line for, I think, half an hour. <laughs> we just, we're like, okay, no. Um, yeah. Um, we then, we then of course, did the unit economic calculation um, and looked at, looked at the total uh, at the end of the day and we just saw, okay, nobody's ever going to pay for this. And um, I mean, I, yeah, as I said, I still love it, but we... Uh, we killed the app. Uh, we threw out everything we did uh, to this day, and we sat down and, and um, yeah, thought of how to how to go for a better solution. Yeah, well, and that's what, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, that that's when that's when Luca Box was born. We we, I mean, I, I immediately felt the pain. I don't want to have any operations. I don't want to have the staff that actually does the job. All I want to do is use use the professionals out there and just um, mix and match basically. And yeah. um, uh, then we actually turn to a problem that that is one of my biggest problems. I'm extremely impatient, and I hate, I hate, I really, I, I can't emphasize it enough. Slow delivery. <laughs> for for me, the delivery is a part of the product. If if I order a lamp and I need to wait five weeks, I don't want the lamp. You know, yeah. It, I for yeah, I, I pay I pay for the complete package as as a consumer. Uh, I want the delivery to be part of the same quality. It, it needs yeah. to be of the same quality. And then, um, of course, having having the IT management background that I have, um, we also knew it would be a technological solution that would do the mix and matching. So, and that's actually when we turned to the best uh, couriers in in the in Switzerland and put them on our platform, and then we approached retailers and other enterprises who needed fast and flexible deliveries. Yeah. I mean, that all sounds like it was an easy ride. Yeah. Um, uh, changing, pivoting. I mean, we've had other guests before that, you know, they pivoted and then that destroyed their whole startup uh, because they pivoted into a wrong direction. How did you know, you know, how, how did you have that certainty in which direction you wanted to go. I mean, it sounds really clear now, but yeah. I can't imagine that it was that clear at the, yeah. moment, at the time. Of course, no, of course we didn't know whether it was really going to work, but at the time, uh, I mean, coincidence, you know, uh, I don't know, however, serendipity, however you want to call it, but Maite had just uh, written her thesis uh, on, she, she studied um, uh, with a with a focus on logistics, and she had just written her a thesis on last mile logistics, and uh, in particular on demand logistics and how it's on the rise. Mm. And, um, we knew also from we knew that there was a trend change in society towards on demand, and that that's not only in uh, ordering food on demand, uh, but more and more um, consuming media on demand. You know, the, the millennials yeah. today, nobody watches an analog TV anymore, except for Tatort, maybe, <laughs> um, <laughs> which, which I watch uh, on analog TV. Anyways, but um, I watch it when it's, when it's, you know, when it's on. So we knew we knew there was a, cha a, a, a change in, in, the, in how society looked at consuming things. Hmm. And it was just a natural, a natural move towards uh, deliveries, you know, getting faster. And exactly, I mean, we're not only fast. What I think, what I, what our strength is, is we're, we're precise. We yeah. we make the deliveries fit into your life. And you you know, it's. I mean, we we very quickly realized that there was a demand because we spoke to retailers. We went out there, we asked them, you know, so we, we spoke to customers. Would you pay an extra? Would you pay? We did, we did, I don't know how many um, surveys on the top. Yeah. Tell, yeah. tell me more about, about that, those beginnings concretely. Yeah. I mean, did you go, how, how does that look like? I mean, a lot of our listeners are, you know, not entrepreneurs yet and, and don't know what, you know, how do you start? I mean, the, 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 the biggest part of starting is talking about it, talking, uh, talking about your idea with as many different people from as many different, you know, I don't know, backgrounds, whatever, 
um, as possible and always ask for feedback and always ask like is that is this a pain you experience or is this a pain somebody you know experienced you know so yeah um i think that was that was a, a large uh, but we did really use uh we used um type form as a, as a tool to you know send out um service uh mm-hmm. where you get really nice analytics We also put in um, willingness to pay questions. How much exactly would you, you know, pay the premium? Um, for which kind of product would you need it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's really it's and we and then of course we went to all the start, and that's also where we met all the startup events. I think it was by the way. I think it was November 16. That's very possible. Yes. <laughs> Which yeah sounds That's sounds really nice. ago. And if I look back, I was I was really yeah naive. But <laughs> but it's yeah talking, oh, yeah. talking. You know that's the main thing I think. And then try yeah. try it in a little little as little as possible with as little money as possible. And you get you get a feeling for it very quickly. I think. Right, and I imagine you just went to to these uh, you know bike uh, delivery companies and just talked to the people there. Okay to ask if they would be interested in, in something like that. Yeah, that was actually um, surprisingly easy. Uh, they were very open to um, exper- experiment. And, and, and I mean, for them, if, if we would do this right, it would mean potential, large, significant potential income. Exactly. You know, without the whole customer acquisition, which of course we would be doing. So uh, yeah. what was the tough part then? I think the tough part was... Um, I think a little bit believing in ourselves, as weird as that sounds. It's mm-hmm. our first customer was Steak Computers, right? And um, that's not that's not nobody. So <laughs> we're like, oh my god, you know. Th- th- th-. And he was pushing us so hard because he wanted to start, and he had he had lost um, his supplier, and he had heard about us from our bank actually, who recommended us to them in yeah. over a coffee or something, and. Uh, within one week, um, they wanted to to go live with us, and that that was very very stressful because um, we're like, okay, are we that good? You know, can we really do it? Is it gonna work? Uh, of course, we did small pilots, but you can't compare this with um, yeah. you know such a such a big brand. Um, yeah, but um, the the. Yeah, it was it was probably a good a good lesson because they trusted us. They trusted us enough to bring their products to their customers. Yeah. And um, they were very happy with the service. I mean, we have a very high, uh, up to the, up to date, actually, up to date, we have a very high success rate uh, in delivering because the customer expects it, you know, at a certain time. Yeah. So, yeah, but that, that was the biggest hurdle to actually, at some point, you, you know, you're, you're like, as you, as you probably, you know, the feeling, I'm sure you can relate, it's like, okay, but this is bullshit. Okay, this is never gonna work. Whatever, and and I start, maybe I'm stupid, and maybe I maybe I should never quit my job. I mean, I was I was still in a full time position um, at UPC at the time, and I'm like, I'm never gonna quit my job. This is just it's uh, it's it's completely crazy. And um, with with every additional delivery, basically, or every additional transaction, you're 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 believing in it a little bit more, and yeah. um, and then you just need to go. Um, you 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 you're a little more daring in talking to customers because you know you you actually have something that people pay for you know so, yeah exactly uh, you had, that, i mean you had your first customer um which is a great it's a great help when you go talk to the, your second customer yeah um but i mean i i don't know a lot about b2b um customer acquisition yeah could you could you tell me a bit more about how you how you acquired your second customer so the first one was was very it was through your bank which was yeah. which is very nice how how did you acquire the next customers how, how did that go mm, i would actually need to look up who my who the next customers were but the, the, the next i know i remember the next one was actually a recommendation again by somebody uh who then approached us But um, the first, I think, five or six customers came through recommendations and not through any active sales activity on our part. It was more, I was spending a lot of time pitching um, at uh, various startup events where we, of course, got quite a lot of exposure. 
And um, that helped enough for uh, some people that, you know, who needed some quick and fast uh, deliveries to actually think of LucaBox in that connection. So yeah. in that, yeah. Um, and after, but after, I think only after six or seven months did we, did we look into actively doing sales. Yeah. So really putting yourself out there really, really helps. Yes. Uh, of course, because people see you. I have a I have a question uh, regarding the pricing. You mentioned you um, at the very beginning asked you know questions about how much people would pay for such a solution. I'm I'm working with with a friend on on our own startup on the side, and pricing is is an art, and it's 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 so difficult to price a product or a service correctly. How did you? You know, so you did those surveys, but did you do anything else to to kind of figure out what prices you could um, ask from people? Mm -hmm. Also, considering this, you know, uh, free delivery trend um, that you know people or we have talked to a lot of people who expected a free delivery. Mm -hmm. So, um, how did how did you manage the the setting of your prices? Well, I mean, that's that's a bigger answer because the the we're in basically what people then buy in the end is a logistic service, right? And as, as you just said, um, unfortunately, there's a trend towards free deliveries because what happens um, through that trend is that people think logistics is cheap. Uh -huh. And logistics, especially on the last mile, will always be more expensive because there will always be people involved until, until the drones will be economically viable or the delivery robots uh, will actually find their way, okay? Before that, there will always be people. And, of course, we did a lot of benchmarking. Uh, we looked at, okay, what do others others charge? And, and also we asked retailers, what would you be willing to pay? Because, I mean, in the end, it's not the end customer, but the retailer who pays us or the enterprise who uses the service. Um, what we did is we since one of our values is um, or one of our missions is to create sustainable last mile logistics, we need to make sure that the end courier is paid fairly. So that's the basic, that's how it's, it's more a cost driven approach than a value driven approach. It's not, we don't ask the, the we don't, I mean, of course we, we do have a d different pricing levels for different customers, but in, in general, it's just, it's based on what we pay the couriers when we pay them fairly. Yeah. And, that makes it pretty easy. So we put uh, we put a margin on top, and and that's that's for the access to the complete platform, which you know is is already really large. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a simple price calculation on our side. Yeah, I can see I can see uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's one thing uh, I asked you before the interview, and and uh, it was it was regarding you, a, a big mistake, or if you could share a big mistake. Um, and it was regarding investors. Yeah. And I mean, for every every entrepreneur, that's that's interesting. Um, and for for me, even more, because you know, I I might be talking to investors mm -hmm. um, this year. So, what what was that about? If, can you tell me a bit more about about that? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the whole the whole fundraising. Um, experience is one of the largest learning curves in my life. It's uh, and it still is. We're in our second uh, financing round. In the first financing round, I was very trustful, um, and with trustful, um, I mean really being honest about uh, topics like the the run the runway. And I'm not saying I'm not saying to lie to investors. I'm just saying to I think it, it was very important to learn about the dynamics and about how also appearing strong and in a powerful like in a in a position of power when you when you talk to investors because after all you know you're actually meeting at eye level. They're looking for great startups, you're looking for money. It's a it's a deal uh, on eye level and it should um, it should be a trust Tit relationship, but I realized that some investors um, really use that against you. Uh -huh. They would um, prolong, uh, you know, the due diligence on purpose to because they know you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna be standing against the wall very soon. Yeah, you're gonna run out of money. Yeah, and I've, I've had this with a, with a few actually. Um, where I felt okay now they're either they either use they're either making how do you say it? Or they're either making use of 
seeing you're naive, you know, or they see you don't you don't have a clue and they're using it against you. Um, that's not, that's not, I mean, that happens to you once it will never happen again, because I know everything about it now, you know, so, but at the time I didn't. And at the time it was the investors basically showing me the way and telling me how investing works, Yeah. which is never, which never puts the founder in a good position. Right. No, no, not at all. Yeah. That, that was, um, that was a very, very painful uh, and also, also actually honestly hurtful uh, experience because basically in my, in my point of view, we needed help and that was used against us. Yeah. Yeah. So I, the, 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 the dynamics really weren't good. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, you know, stories of, you know, between founders and investors and things going wrong. It, it, just from your learning, Mm-hmm. What what should a, a a newbie entrepreneur or founder you know look out for? Is there is there anything that you know someone who doesn't know all that you have learned can you know can can look out for or can? Yeah, first of all, I think the the most important thing is, and it's a huge learning curve, but but people need to understand the term sheets. They need to understand what every clause in there really means and, and what the impact is of however it is um, worded. Uh-huh. Um, I, I've gotten a, a very good uh, reading tip, book tip, by our currently current CFO. He was our coach at the time, and it's called Venture Deals. Uh-huh. Um, I, can't, I can't think of the author right now, but that's really, it, it tells you everything about the dynamics um, of, of the various levers you can, you know, um, turn or not turn in a term sheet, but you need you need you definitely need to know about liquidation preference, enter dilution. Um, you need to really know how 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 important your valuation is for you. It's it's just you need to have a very strong understanding of negotiation um, points, um, and you need to understand what's important to your investor. It's uh-huh. you also need to understand the different investor types because they need they have different different motivations. What, what types are off of your head? What, what types are there? Um, I mean, th- there are angels. Oh, those t- like, you mean angels, VCs? I okay. those. It's not, uh, it, yeah. Cause okay. they, they also, they need, they use different, different, um, yeah, they have different motivations and goals when they go into a deal with a startup. But the most important thing really is to understand the term sheet. You need, you need to understand each and every bit you need to understand yeah the the board composition the the voting rights you need to understand every bit mm-hmm. and i mean what really helped us was to have a very very good and strong lawyer in our back um and it was in this case it was keller hals uh, and and up to this day i'm, I'm talking to them again daily because you know we're, we're trying to close this round um, they need to have your best interest in mind and they need to understand the dynamics of uh, investor and startup relations. Mm. How is that? How is that? I've just recently talked to other founders um, that have shared with me that one big challenge are, are legal costs. Mm-hmm. And especially at the beginning, uh, you know, lawyers uh, are, are expensive because they're very well educated and they're very good at what they do. Yeah. How, how did you start? You know your relationship with with a lawyer was it? Yeah, how how did it, how did it, that go? I mean, if you if you say if, if you think about what a lawyer costs you, and if you think about what it might cost you if you don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> then I'd rather invest in a good lawyer. But yeah, totally. Yeah. If you have if you have a good lawyer that's uh, used to work with uh, startups, they will give you um, they will give you a package deal, yeah. which is always negotiable. Um, and uh, yeah, we're of course they're expensive, but they're, for me they're worth every penny. Definitely, and I can I can share that as well. Uh, I've I've talked to other founders about that, and it's really worth it. Yeah. <laughs> I've I've we've had uh, founders on on the show that shared about the shared costs with us that they had because they didn't have a lawyer in the beginning, you know, yeah. for for their brand or or their name or whatever it was. Definitely. Yeah. So I have a, a couple of final questions mm-hmm. that uh, I usually ask uh, all of our guests. And the first one is, what's something crazy that you believe that nobody else around you believes? Yeah, I answered that question in the form, but I don't remember what I put. 
Let me check. You believe or you are deeply convicted that life is a playground to be enjoyed the last bit. Ah, yeah. It's not supposed to be hard. Work is supposed to motivate and inspire you to your core. You have to find your mojo. Everything will follow. Love, joy, and success. Right. Are you sure you're the only one believing that? <laughs> no. I can see myself, but it's something great to believe. Yeah. No, but I, that was a hard question because, I mean, uh, yeah. But uh, what it is, it is. The, the reason why I put this is um, also now as a founder, I've um, talked to investors or um, startup coaches or whatever who are under the impression that startup life must be grueling it must be hard you know you don't have money you can't eat if you're lucky you have a place to sleep you know and ideally you sleep in your office if you have an office because you know it's, it, seriously i've met those and, I, and i'm like are you serious like you know get out it's it no that's why i put this here and i've, I've met it more i've met people like this more often uh, than i than i would like actually and yeah. I know you. I know where we think alike. You know. I mean, I follow. Yeah. So I know we have a, a very similar mindset, but it's not not everybody. Has, also, not every uh, startup founder has this. Like, yeah. But I, but I, I do believe, and it's very ni- very very nice that you put it here. I think it's it's important to share, you know, future entrepreneurs that it life your entrepreneurship life is not going to be you know what uh, elon musk's entrepreneurship life was you know sleeping in the office uh, yeah <laughs> coding at night and yeah. doing something else during the day and so and also yeah if you if you have a good partner i mean it's so much fun seriously mm-hmm. and it's really a a ride to enjoy yeah it's i mean you the thing is i'm, I'm not saying you're not going to work much or hard because you will you know, you will. Oh, you will. Um, I mean, I, for me, for me, Luca Box is my life. I do have a little, you know, I do have some hobbies that I sometimes, you know, take time for, and then I really thoroughly enjoy that time. But um, this, this is the journey I want to enjoy now, and um, it's, 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 it's thrilling, you know. Yeah. Uh, even, even the downs, you know, where you just, I mean, of course I have days where I just, you know, want to lay in bed and have, you know, pull the blanket over my head. And I even take those days sometimes, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, to, to rejuvenate, but yeah, no, it's, it, it needs to be fun. And if it's not fun, then you're not doing the right thing. Exactly. That's a good, it's a good indicator. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Definitely. No, I just remember my, my, my partner last Monday telling me, he was so much looking forward to meet on Monday morning at work. <laughs> um, and, and it's just that. It just has to be like that. That's if not, yeah. you're doing something wrong. Is there, the second question, is there any other topic that we haven't covered yet that you'd like to talk about that you believe you know, to be important for aspiring entrepreneurs? Something that I've missed to ask. Mm-hmm. And now you're talking, I don't remember my answer there again. Did I ask something? Yes. Yeah. Curiosity. Always ask why. Yes. I think, um, like when when I meet young entrepreneurs and I, I and I do coach, I do coach a few. Um, the more questions, it's the quality of the questions that tell me if they're going to make it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you if you meet young the hungry entrepreneurs, you know, they're going to, oh my God, they're going to kill you with questions. Yeah. Um, you, you can, I think it's staying curious about anything. It's the same with the investors. I mean, of course there was pain that actually made me learn more, but now, now I'm hungry, you know, I'm hungry to understand why and, and, you know, also understand why the investors are the way they are and what, what's in for them. Now it's all clear to me, but it was, it was an enigma before. Hmm. And um, the, more, the more you ask, the more you learn, and just the, the, the better you are and the better you can, you can build this company. Yeah. My last question for you is, what is the last book you read or video you saw or blog post you read that you would recommend to entrepreneurs? Ah, that's a good I think I think we have covered one at least uh, this this venture deal yeah. uh, book. Is there anything else? Venture deals. Let me just quickly. Venture deals is a must. But what I've just been reading and it's extremely inspiring um, is called the Pumpkin Plan. 
a pumpkin plant. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And um, I, some, of, some of the team uh, are reading it right now and everybody's loving it. Um, it's, it's by the author who also wrote um, The Toilet Entrepreneur, I think. He's, he's very he's different in his language, but he's, he's very no bullshit. And he's extremely inspiring about how to stay focused in your stay focused with your choice of customers I and mean, we, we he actually gives you advice on how to fire the customers um that are not part of your pumpkin basically you know okay. it, it's the, the whole idea is to grow this this it's it's what's your sweet spot basically it's all about your sweet spot what's your what's your product really about and and because i mean we're now with, with luca box is now one and almost a half years old and we have um, a technology that many, many people could use for many, many different use cases. Uh -huh. uh, and it's, it's very tempting to build, you know, um, customized solutions all the time. And, and he just, he just makes it so clear on how to stay to stay true to your core and really throw away the customers, even fire the customers, uh, even, the, even though there might be big brands. We already have some nice big brands that we, we need to, maybe let go at some point because yeah. um, they're causing too much issue. He, isn't, he even has a thing, and I love that, he calls it um, how high is the cringe factor with that customer. <laughs> I, love I love it. And, and you know exactly what it means. It's like you look, at, you look at your phone and it's this certain customer and you're like, oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, there are those customers. Yeah, it's a very refreshing book and uh, I really highly recommend it. I'm not, I'm not big on podcasts, by the way. It's, I don't, don't ask me why. It's not, nothing against your podcast, of course. No, no nothing. It's, 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 it's an up and coming um, channel, yeah. but uh, it's not everybody's uh, meal. Definitely, yeah. definitely. I'm I'm so into books. Half yeah. of my or a quarter of my room is is just filled with books. So I'm definitely gonna buy the pumpkin plan. No, you should. You should. It's it's for me. Podcasts are a little bit like uh, audio books. They put me to sleep, and not because of the content. I can read the. You know, it's it's just for me. It's so calming, and it's just no. It's, yeah. I mean, that's amazing. A, a podcast ha has so many functions. Yeah. It's amazing. It can be inspiring. It can put you to sleep. Yeah, it can be calming. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much for, for your answers. This has been really inspiring. And I have learned so much. Um, just the investor story is so valuable for me. I'm definitely going to buy the book. And yeah, thank you so much for, for taking the time. My pleasure, Daniel. Thanks for inviting me again. It took some time to get to the... But we made it. Yes, we did. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. That was it. Thank you for listening to another episode of Startup Stories. Make sure to check out the show notes with additional links to all the books I can mention at nerdentrepreneurs.com. And if you like our podcast, leave a review on iTunes. See you on Monday.